Hello, boys and girls of Credit Union Land, and welcome to the CU Insight Experience. My name is Randy Smith. I'm one of the co-founders of CUinsight.com, and it is my job on the show to have conversations with the best and the brightest from around the credit union community. I get to pick their brains and see if we can find a few nuggets that we can all learn from. My guest on today's show is Julie Ferguson. Julie Ferguson is a consultant in the credit union movement who focuses primarily on business development. Julie is a friend of mine, a fellow wanderlust, small business owner. Every time Julie and I uh, have the chance to get together and chat, we just have a blast. And this episode of the podcast was no different. This may be one of my favorite locations that I've ever recorded the podcast at. We are at the 20th Saka Congress in Mombasa, Kenya. Both of us were invited by our friends over at Akaska, and we are recording this episode about 100 yards from the Indian Ocean, sitting on a couple beach loungers. So you, you can't beat that. We talked about a lot. We talked about travel and development, uh, talked a lot about business development, and uh, our experience in Kenya as well. This was just a, a packed episode it, that was a lot of fun to uh, record. I hope you and enjoy listening as much as we enjoyed recording it. So with that, and without further ado, I give you my conversation with Julie Ferguson. Julie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Randy. Oh, I, this is, I have to say, location-wise, we are sitting here on, on a couple of... Uh, beach loungers staring at the Indian Ocean in Mombasa, Kenya. Both of us are attending the 20th Saka Congress that our friends at Akaska put on. You did a pre-conference workshop, participated in the first ever Africa Cooperative Women's Forum. I mean, it's been an amazing week. Yes, 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 it has. Transformative. And I think um, for me, one of the highlights of my entire career Today's the last day, and we're heading back after a week with spending time with leaders from 31 countries, 31 countries. It's insane, isn't it? Yeah, it's insane. Yeah, it's been pr pretty amazing and pretty inspiring. I, I know both you and I, in the process of this week, have even come up with our DE project. Yes. So we will probably share that for, uh, you know, maybe if we're a little bit further down that road when this is published, we'll uh, link to yes, stuff in yes, there. But yes. uh, I'm very excited about I, both of ours. I, it's, it, it is so cool. I, I know we've talked all week long, and, you know, many of our friends like Lois and, you know, Bert Hash and Michael Ray, and, I mean, just Ren Rempe and so many, the Cheneys, uh, you know, they. I think we've all talked about how not only inspiring, but just like yeah. almost transformational this yes, week has been yes, for us. Yes, um, yes. And the work that you've done on the Don Bosco schools, um, the video, I had tears <laughs> in my eyes. And so if you haven't had a chance to see that, take a look at that. We will. We'll link to that, too. I appreciate that. That was quite the moment. There's so many things that we can talk about, but I, I do want to really kind of hone in on a couple. Both of us share a love for travel. Even before we met in person, we were wander less social media friends, right? Where we had mutual friends who were like, you guys would love each other. And then I obviously want to get into business development because that's, that's what you're here teaching the Africans. That's yes. what we're, you know, I yes. mean, that's what you are known for. So I'd like to start with travel because I always want to start with travel if I can. So, you know, we're on this trip. Both of us are kind of I'd say exploring ways to mix our passion for travel and credit unions. Why? So let's just start there. Why is the experience of travel so important yeah. to you? Yeah, I know. I know. I became a DE in April of this year, too. So the ability for me to be able to marry my love of travel, international travel specifically, with credit unions is just like makes my heart happy. The first time I traveled was in my late 20s. And First Tech, I was working at First Tech Federal Credit Union, and they actually gave me a month off, which I couldn't believe. Um, because that's not usually a normal request. Not, um, in, the, not in America, <laughs> right? No, not in America. In other countries. I, I often say I was born in the wrong country. Um, but I traveled and I used Rick Steves. So I traveled all over uh, Europe. And really, I have bought into his travel philosophy. And it's all about the people. And for me, I don't know if I could have articulated this in my 20s. But for me, it's broadened my perspective. And one of the quotes that I love that he shares is that travel, what it does is that the palette that we paint our lives with, when you travel, you add more color. 
you add more color. And you're so inspired by the people. And that's been true this week and on every trip. I try to engage with the people. And so I spend all of my money on travel. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've had discussions about both of us taking a more minimalist lifestyle to buy yes, plane tickets. Yes, so, yes, yeah, yes. that's for sure. And I've enjoyed, I've always enjoyed those conversations that we shared a lot of them, I think, here this week. Uh, along with being my wanderlust friend, uh, you're also a small business owner. So that's yes. something you and I also share and, and we talk quite a, a lot about on an earlier uh, podcast Jill and I were speaking over after the summer kind of doing the location mm-hmm. independent thing yep. about some in of Spain. the in Spain <laughs> yep. yeah but some of the there's a ton of benefits and I want to make sure that we touch on those as well but there sometimes there are some maybe misconceptions is a better word that uh, sure. you know that we're on vacation when, when we're really not is that something that I guess, is that a struggle that you've dealt with? Is it, you know? Yeah, uh, I, and maybe I'm making it my own struggle, but I'm pretty transparent. If anyone follows me on social media, you'll know that my life is pretty transparent and I share, I'm a social person. And I think the biggest challenge for travelers is that, sure, I take vacations once in a while, but most of the time I'm traveling. And so for the last two years, I'll give you an example. I spent six weeks in Italy each of the last two years working, working, living. (laughs) And when I would have call, and let me explain a little bit about my business. The most that I'm on site with a client for a longer term project is every six to eight weeks. And so I I can, if I'm smart with, and I am the master of my schedule, I can schedule open times where I can do the remote stuff anywhere around the world. Absolutely. As long as I'm with a time zone that works. Uh, And so in Italy, for example, anyone that I would talk to at the end of the conversation would say, enjoy the rest of your vacation. (laughs) And I would want to say, no, 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 I'm just living. But I think in people's minds, when they think about Italy, you know, you're at the Duomo, you're in these beautiful piazzas having huge bowls of pasta that just like makes you swoon. And then you're maybe having a carafe of wine with it and you wander. And then you, after that, what you're doing is you're taking a siesta. And so that's not what my life is like when I'm location independent. I can be just as as effective in Italy as I can in Portland, Oregon. Absolutely. I, I know over the summer, I actually, because of the time change difference, I found myself working more. I would yeah. still get up at, <laughs> at uh, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, mm-hmm. start working. Everybody back on the East Coast where the rest of the CU Insight team would start at basically noon my time yep. and I would continue working through the night, you know, yep. type of thing with them. And uh, mm-hmm. I'm like, geez, I have to actually do a better job of this. Yes, and I yes. thought I'd gotten good at it. Yes. But, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, you just did mention your business. And one of the things that I, I re- there were a couple different things. One you said this week, and I've, I've repeated it multiple times to you, so you know I'm probably going to bring it up. But I've always loved getting to know you, how well defined your business is. Yes. Um, and yes. it's, it's uh, your, your work in business development. And you work in business development. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I've i heard other people say, Julie, she does like marketing and business development. And you're like, you're not a marketer, you're a business <laughs> developer, right? <laughs> but and then the other thing that I would love for you to touch on here is you, you mentioned earlier this week, I thought it was beautiful, that like your goal is to work yourself out of a job with credit unions. Yeah, I know, uh, I know. So it is. It can, is. can you expand yeah. on that yeah, a little yeah. bit or tell our listeners what, that, okay. what that's all about? Okay. So my business turned 10 this year, and I'm very proud of that earlier or in 2019. My business turned 10 in 2019. And, you know, I'm true to business development, but I would say more growth related. And so the two areas um, are getting new members and then maximizing the existing relationships we have. So deepening those existing relationships. Now, when you look at business development, it touches on strategic planning. It touches on marketing. We need messaging for business development. And so I would say it's more looking at growth through the lens of business development. And so what that means is if I were to go into a credit union, say it's a community credit union, and, and they're all excited and they serve everyone who lives, works, or worships in an area, and I ask them about their target market, and they're like, one million people. <laughs> well, then I, and so I have to say, oh my goodness. <laughs> and um, so we have to further define that because we can't be all things to all people. Right. And we have to, even if you are open, you should have, in my opinion, a target market. And what does that member look like? What are you really good at doing? And then do that really well. Who are you really good at working with? And do that really well. And so so there is some strategic planning that goes into it, but I'm not a strategic planning facilitator. Right. I'll right. go in and help with a piece of it. Um, and then there's a lot of collaboration with marketing on evolving the materials. For example, if, you, um, if you're a SEG-based credit union, 
and you are not sharing statistics about financial wellness and the impact on the workplace, I think you're missing an opportunity. That would be an example of how I would collaborate with the marketing team to evolve the marketing materials to have a better message, to better relate to those SEGs and sponsor companies about why they should partner with us. So... I'm going to tie the next question in with the last one. Do you have any hacks? Because when we were, we were having a conversation a few days ago with Bill and Chrissy Cheney here, and you were talking about it's not, Bill was talking about schools first being, you know, a seg based. It just serves teachers. And you were saying it's not only external business development, but business development to the internal credit union yeah. as well. Do you have any hacks that you could share with our listeners on how you work yourself out of a job. Oh, I know I do. You know, and I didn't, I, I knew that I was trying to work myself out of a job, but I didn't really put it that way. I'd given a credit union some references, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago. <laughs> and they called one and um, then they called me back and actually and hired me. And they said, yeah, they said you were really good at working yourself out of a job. And we like that. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's fantastic. So, yeah. So I don't, I think I, uh, my approach is really to give the tools to the team to be able to continue to open channels for growth. And if I don't do that, I can't be used as a crutch. Then I, um, my report card comes after I leave. Yep. And if they can continue to evolve and grow, then I feel like I've been successful. And yes, this week I've had the opportunity to get to know Bill and Chrissy Cheney. And they are wonderful people. I'm like many people in our credit union movement. If someone says, do you know Bill Cheney? You would say yes, but really you don't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, they've made such an impact here. And it's just been um, wonderful spending some time with them. But we were talking about member engagement. And, you know, I think there's, there's three tips that I'd like to share with you. And this is really for anyone that's dealing with members. So those, those employees that are dealing face-to-face -face with members or remotely or on the phone. Ask smart questions is the first one. So for an example, if you're sitting across the desk from a potential new member, you could ask them or say, share with me some of your short-term financial goals. So they come in for a savings and a checking, and you're asking that question, and that's opening up opportunities for you to really help them. Um, the second would be to listen, and the better listeners we are, the better opportunities and things we can uncover on how we can help make their financial lives better and empower them. And then the last one that if I've, if I've worked with you, you'll know that I say this a lot. It's stay in the driver's seat. And what I mean by that is if someone, and stay in the driver's seat of the dialogue, if someone comes in to a teller or calls and says, you know, I'm interested, I have a couple questions about a mortgage loan. I've never, I've, I'm buying my first house. Um, what we don't want to do is give information and then say, reach back out to us when you're interested. We're losing that opportunity. Somebody else is going to take take that mortgage from us. What we want to do is say, Joe in our mortgage department will reach out and talk with you more in depth. He has all of the information. And so whenever, never say, get back to us. Always stay in the driver's seat of that dialogue with the member. Ah, I think that is a fantastic hack. That's for sure. So I bet you're helping out some BD people right now that are listening. Uh, you know, last question in this section. You've helped a ton of credit unions over the past decade. You, you mentioned 10 year anniversary. Congratulations. Yay, thanks. Our, our businesses have been around similar lengths of time. We're coming up on our 11th year and in that time, we've went from, I think it was 11,000 credit unions down to 5,000. Is there, I, I mean, I think it really does tie into like what you were saying from a BD standpoint, but working with these credit unions out there, do you see something that you think credit unions have to fundamentally change uh, and quickly to, to remain relevant? Here's what, <laughs> here's what I know for sure. Through working with employees all over the country, what I see is that over and over is that the more engaged your employees are, the more engaged your members are. And I see that over and over repeatedly as I work with your employees that are dealing with members on a daily basis yep. and that are responsible for, for growth and, and even the leaders. The more engaged the employees are, the more engaged your members are. I think that's good advice when we... It's so many times we, and I think it, that was the Saka Congress where at the, the theme was servant leadership. And yes. so often it was 
coming back to being engaged. Yes. You know? um, yes. Yeah. That's for Leading sure. with heart. Ah, I love it. And when we move on to the second part of the show, the, the leadership and life hacks, where we get to know you a little bit better. Uh, first question, what inspired you a decade ago to, to leave First Tech? You mentioned that's where you'd been for, for, for many years and, and start your own business. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> um, uh, so I was at First Tech 16 years. Yeah. And, you know, that used to be like, wow, you know, something you're proud of. But now when I tell the, the younger leaders, they say, oh, how long were you at First Tech? And I say, 16 years. And they look at me like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> because <laughs> people, you know, yeah. I think that's that's a, a sign of the times. Um, people switch jobs more. Yep. And, yep. Um, you know, and I think that's, that, that's a good thing. But I left First Tech. Um, I wanted to travel around the world. Um, I had a money set aside that I had saved. Um, I had priorities of travel. And I was going to travel until my money ran out. And I knew that they let me take a month off, but I didn't think they'd let me take six months to a year off. Okay. And, and I was ready for a change. Honestly, I was ready to do something different. I didn't know I was going to start my own business at the time. I just knew I was going to travel around the world. When I returned, so I made it seven months and then okay. my money ran out. I spent too much time in Europe. That's what I, that's right. what so I did. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, you should have went to Asia. Yeah, I know. I know. I did go to, I did go to Southeast Asia and, yeah. and I could have spent two years there. Right. <laughs> yeah. But I'm a Europe junkie a little bit. So. Uh. But um, when I came back, I had taken a job actually that did not fit my values and I didn't re- recognize at the time I worked at a casino actually really? for a year. Yes. Okay. Um, as the player that. development manager, I was doing some help with a marketing firm and the marketing firm, um, I knew someone that sent me to the CEO of the casino and I thought they, they spend money on marketing and he, he offered me a job and the money, I got a limo, I got a suite at the Rose Garden <laughs> in Portland, Oregon. Um, I think it's called the Moda Center now. But I, I figured out what my values were during that time, and I, it became crystal clear to me. And so I, I left that casino job, but then I was not working. And uh, someone that was on the chapter board contacted me in Oregon and won a federal credit union, um, was my first client. <laughs> and they asked me to come. They said, oh, since you're unemployed. And I said, um, I prefer to think of it as reinventing myself. <laughs> Will you come and help the branch managers learn some BD skills? Because they, a lot of credit unions at the time, and even now, the branch managers stay within those four walls most of the time. Yeah. They're not proactively going out and, and getting um, business. So I called my mentor and a former colleague at First Tech, Denise Wymore, and I said, should I do this for like a real business? And she said, hell yes. Uh, Pardon my language. <laughs> heck yes. She said, heck yes. <laughs> De- Denise will be on the podcast here soon too. So actually she's scheduled. Oh, great, so. <laughs> great, great. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, I love that. So here's the question. So you figured out that I didn't know that about the going to work for the casino yeah, for a year. And yeah. So wow. I have a lot of stories, but I, I, I can imagine. Now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you come back, you know, you, you realize that that's not aligning with your values. And then, you know, through, you know, speaking with friends and mentors and, you know, it sounds like just a first credit union client, you, you decide to start your business over the past decade. Has the inspiration changed at all with time on the job? I think I care, I I continue to care more and more about inspiring others to make a difference. When I started it, I was more focused. I mean, I think the spotlight was more on me a little bit, if that makes sense, and building my business and building my career. And that has completely shifted now to trying to connect people and help others thrive and find their way and make an, make an impact. I, I know. Speaking of connections, you were uh, the one who encouraged Lauren to apply for our CEO I'm job. So, so happy for we her. We thank you for that. Oh, <laughs> she's a rock star. She's a rock star. We could not be happier. Yeah. Um, you've worked with a lot of leaders over the years, obviously, and then you know taking their message down to the to the front line, who actually is doing the work. Is there a trait in leaders that that you see as, or maybe you admire uh, when you see a good leader of a credit union? Yeah, collaboration collaboration, being genuine, you know, caring about the team, you know, leading, I think leading, you know, leading with heart, what we talked with the Cheneys earlier this week about leading with heart and, and being excited, you know, you know, Bill is going through some changes at schools first. They have some fun stuff coming up. And, you know, I, I could have been talking to a 10 year old. I mean, like the, the excitement, <laughs> the excitement. Is just, yeah. And I think just that genuine enthusiasm about new things and evolution, I think, is, is pretty powerful for the teams to thrive. 
have you noticed a change in leadership styles, say from, I mean, you mentioned 16 years at First Tech, now a decade into, you know, working with credit unions all over the country. Have you noticed a change? Does it seem like people are? Yeah, I think, I think one change and, and, you know, I'm not inside day to day at credit unions. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, no. so from, was... from my vantage point, what I see is we've broken down the silos more. Okay. I think yeah. I think there's there you know back to the collaboration I think there is more collaboration there obviously there are still silos but I th- I think that we're working more as as team members at least that's what I see in the credit unions that I'm going into a lot more open doors policies and you know I think yeah, I think just more collaboration. That not just somebody locked in the corner office, right? So yes, exactly. Uh, is is there something I was actually interested to ask you this question? When you're working with credit unions, is there and let's say it's somebody that you've had an engagement with for a few years, is there something they've heard you say so many times by the end they're finishing your sentence? Yeah, well, it's two words really. They hear me say over and over and over, and it's be memorable. <laughs> be be mem- memorable. <laughs> Expand on that, please. What, what do be you mean memorable. by memorable? Yeah, I we mean, are dealing with human. I I know we're a financial institution. I know that's um, serious business. We're handling people's money, but we're also dealing with humans. And so when we're interacting with our contacts at our SEGs, with our community leaders, um, we want to be genuine. Um, we want to we want to have some fun with it. We want we want to be interesting in what we're giving away and our messaging, the marketing collateral, the table days, the digital outreach. Everything needs to have you know a level of relevance. And as a human, does that have an emotional connection? And why should they care? And pe- and it's uh, it's about feelings. Yep. So be memorable. Yes. I love it. Um, it- when you think back to earlier in your career, and I would take this, you know, even broader, but was there a mistake that you made or one that you see young leaders make often? I think one of the things is, you know, and Neen James, I think you had Neen James yep. on your podcast. She said something to me. She's She was living in the Philadelphia area and I was as well. So I was able to see her speak. She's awesome. And one of the things that she said that made me think about my younger days was, you need to walk into situations like you deserve to be playing in that sandbox. You deserve to be in that sandbox. And I think the hesitation sometimes, I think I would have taken, you know, more risks maybe and um, been a little bit more bold. You know, the, and I it, still see that when I deal with young people. I, I, I can see that. See that. Uh, yet last night at the, uh, the closing party, I was so impressed and I had a chance to meet him at dinner earlier in the week was this gentleman by the name of Daniel from Total Cooperative in Nigeria. And he was he's the chair of their young leaders. Yeah. Group. And he had the, the swagger about him yes, that I loved. Um, yes. But he I mean, he spoke to the room and said, we are here. We are ready. Yes. And we're, we're taking yes. it. You I know? was and so I, impressed with him. I loved it because I know I didn't have that type yeah. of swagger at his age. Yep. So yep. I, I thought yep. it was beautiful. Yeah. So yeah. what you're saying is like, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. own it. So <laughs> yeah, he, and he was owning it last night. Oh, he was absolutely, absolutely was. owning it. Yeah. <laughs> look out. He, Africa. He will, yeah. The young people are coming. <laughs> the young people are And the women. <laughs> and the women. Yeah, yes. it's been a very big focus. That's for sure. Empowering here, so. women. Has there been a piece of advice or, or a life lesson that you find yourself going back to over and over again? Uh, yes, actually. Um, Gretchen Wakeham was uh, my manager for uh, some of the years while I was at First Tech. And yeah. I've actually never told her that I use this <laughs> advice now even. I love that. Um, I was all worked up about a situation with a leader. And I was determined that I was right. Absolutely 100% right. And I went marching in and I was ready to be like, you know, supported and the situation. And she looked at me after I rambled on about like, you know, all the issues. And she said, you have two choices. You have two choices, only two. You either figure out a way to make it work or you make a change. Those are the two choices. And I sat there stunned, (laughs) stunned because I was, that was like the, not the, not the reaction I was expecting. And I left and I didn't realize later what a good life lesson that was until later what a good life lesson that was. But I made it work and then the situation ended up resolving itself. So it was fine. But there's so many things that we don't have control over. Yep. 
And we have, we really have those two choices. And so I continue to use that. I was going to say like center yourself back to that spot. All the time. I go back to that repeatedly. I need to make this work or I need to make a change. And I also have shared this advice with a lot of credit union people that either are complaining about something or another. They're marinating in the mud puddle about some issue. They're having pity parties. And it really comes down to that's a choice that you're doing. And so you either make, make it work or you make a change. If you have a free day, nothing on the calendar, no matter where you are in the world, yes. you know, what do you do to unwind when you disconnect from, from the business? Yes. Uh, you know, yeah. and, and what does, we, we talked a little bit about work-life balance and integration, mm-hmm. but like, what does that look like to you? Oh, well, I'm a runner. So running is my reset button. So um, I love to run. After I run, um, I always try to run in beautiful locations if I can. So I'll pick a location. And then I love to sit at coffee shops and eat pastries afterwards. So I don't know, <laughs> but run. it just makes me so happy. <laughs> and I'll sit there. Sometimes my husband will be like, are you ever coming home? I thought you were running just five miles. <laughs> and I'm hanging out in a coffee shop. But um, you, 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 know. you and Jill, just five miles. What does that mean? I'm, I'm a big guy. Yeah. If you've never seen me. Yeah. So. <laughs> but meandering around Philadelphia, you know, we, you know, music, arts. Um, I'm not home that much, and yep. so when I am home, I want to be in my home and in my town and with my family. I, I want to move on. I want to be respectful of your time. We have a beautiful day here that we both can go enjoy. Our last one here. So the rapid fire questions, part yes. three. The questions are rapid. Your answers do not have to be. Do you remember the first time you got into memorable trouble? At least something you can share with us. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Okay, the one I can share. Um, yes, my parents, I'm going to blame my parents. Uh, <laughs> they left and I was 17 and my brother was 14. I think they went to Hawaii. <laughs> they like left. Yeah. And um, I invited a few friends over and you know how that goes. Um, pretty soon the house is full. The cops are coming because the, you know, the boys at the time, it was the 80s, had the big amped up trucks and the lights on the house. And um, yeah, so they were not very happy with me. We even someone put bubbles in the in the hot tub and that crashed that. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That was it, yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. that's why I never had children. <laughs> right. You're like, I yeah. know what they do. I know what so, they do. <laughs> do you know from hanging out with me this week that I journal the start of the day and I feel off if I don't? Is there a daily routine you have that if you don't do it, your day just doesn't feel right. Mm, I always feel better if I run, but I don't run seven days a week. Okay. Um, but I feel better if I run. Coffee is is critical. Um, <laughs> you, you've traveled with <laughs> yeah, coffee, yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. I, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the random question and the one that I know you were stressing over, so I'm interested to see what you have to say here. What's the best album of all time? I know. So earlier in the week, <laughs> I was nervous about the podcast and Randy's like, why are you nervous? And I said, I don't have an album. He's like, that's what you're worried about. (laughs) I'm like, I know. (laughs) So you come um, up with anything? Yeah. Well, right now I'm a fangirl of um, Brandy Carlisle. So totally um, Brandy Carlisle. But I just play Pandora and um, Hot Child in the City. Let me just tell you, that is an awesome Pandora station. (laughs) Oh, that's the station. Yeah. We will link to that Pandora station. (laughs) As you know, Jill and I are both readers and we have a stack of books at the house for most of them have been recommended to us and now a lot from the podcast. Is there a book that you've either gifted to people over time or that you just think everybody should read? You know, I am, I'm a big reader and I have a reading goal on Goodreads and the, the sales book that I think is manageable for everybody, not everybody is a, is a big reader and, right. not, and fewer people like to read business books. But Jeffrey Gittimer has a book and it's an older book, but it's called The Little Red Book of Selling. Anybody can read it. It's about, it's a lot about the value. It's a lot about building relationships. There's some really good tips in there. So I, I, I try to have a book that is manageable because if I give a big book to someone and they're not a reader, it, it won't go anywhere. Absolutely. Do you yeah. have a favorite travel book? Um, oh, wow. Ve- um, Vagabonding. I was just going to say that. Vagabonding is my Bible. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, I uh, love that book. That's one of two books that just stays almost yes, with me. It's not yes. even in the bookshelf. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's ready. It, it traveled all over the world with me, actually. I took that book. That's, I had and that I went back, I went to to it, back to it, back to it. I have a lot of it memorized. Uh, to Bali and everything. I've taken that with me places. That's so if anyone sure. wants to quit their job and travel around the world, Randy and I can help you. <laughs> we, can, we can help. We, we have a new consulting business. Yes, no. exactly. <laughs> It starts with the book Vagabonding <laughs> with by Ralph Potts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. uh, as you've gotten older, 
Is there, what's become more important to you? And my favorite part of this question, what's become less important? Stuff has become less and less and less important. And probably a lot of people say that. I know I've listened to podcasts. um, But honestly, it's about priorities. And anytime I am looking to buy something, I think I am making a choice not to travel. Yep. That's what I think. And so, and, um, and so, yeah, so time is so valuable right now as I'm, you know, getting older. Yeah. I'm so young at heart always, <laughs> but, um, yeah, time and stuff is, is not important time and anymore. stuff. Yeah. I, I agree with you there. There's the question that I don't send, but I know you listen to the podcast. So yes. when you hear the word success, who's the first person that comes to mind? Oh, success. I don't know. I think my parents inspire me so much, you know, um, how come? My mom just values family so much, and she's just been, you know, I have lived a very unconventional life. I really have. I I am not your mainstream at all American. I've made some different choices all through my adult life, and she's always just been in my corner. She's always been in my corner. She hasn't always agreed with me, (laughs) um, and that's okay, but she's always been there right there. And I, I, I know she's there. And so, um, so my mom, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. I absolutely love it. We will link to everything we talked about on the, in the show, in the show notes. Uh, so there'll be lots of books and everything else. Final thoughts. Anything you'd like to share with the listeners? Yes. My ask of the listeners would be to think about this quote. And it's, a, it's the former CEO of Disney. And it's, a brand is a living entity, the product of a thousand small gestures. And so if you ask yourself, what are my small gestures that are moving our brand forward or moving the relationship with the employees forward? A thousand small gestures. Every day we should be making small gestures. I absolutely love that. And I was sitting here surprised that you had the whole quote down without reading it or anything. So it's just obviously one that, I say that it sticks a lot. with you. Yeah. I say it a lot. Yeah. If anyone's been to my sessions, you've seen it on a slide. Uh, I absolutely <laughs> love it. Well, we will link to everything we talked about, as I mentioned in the show notes. If people have additional questions of you, what's the, the best way for them to reach out? Email, LinkedIn, yeah, the Twitter email, machine? Yeah, email, LinkedIn, all over. Uh, all I'm over. on Insta, yes. Yes. And I, um, Kelly Parks at Giraffe and her team um, uh, did my website this year. So I have a new website too. So check it out. It is a beautiful website. We will link to the website to all of Julie's contact information and, uh, you know, follow her, reach out to her, ask her all kinds of great questions. Julie, thank you again for taking the time on this beautiful day to record an episode of the podcast. And it has been such a pleasure to even get to know you more as we've spent this transformational yes, time in yes. Mombasa, Kenya together. Yes, so. yes. Thank you, Randy. And now if I'm asked to be on a podcast, I'm going to ask, is it on the Indian Ocean? That's right. Are we staring <laughs> at the, the Indian breeze? Ocean? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you again, Julie, right. so thank much. You. And to everybody else, I hope you enjoy. 